joining the journey of our freedom-seeking ancestors, those who came before us, giving their energy, their wisdom, their courage, and even their lives to help make our global community less racist and more just. And may God bless you today for endeavoring to do your part to transform this very community and institution, Chicago Theological Seminary, into the place it wants to be. The colloquium today was born uh, of an idea that came within meetings of the Center for the Study of Black Faith and Life and the Anti-Racism Committee, um, an idea first given voice by Dr. Joanne Terrell. So we want to thank her for that. The idea was that we would all regularly come together for all school conversations to engage and address important issues in our communities. Each colloquium would focus on a different topic and the whole school would stop, in a sense, the way we're doing now, in order to come together to share information, views, and ideas with the intention of ending the day better equipped to meet our communal and institutional challenges that we were at the beginning of the day right now. Today, we'll face the challenge of, anti -race, of racism at CCF. Our hosts, as I said, are the Center for the Study of Black Faith and Life and the Anti-Racism Committee. Now, as someone pointed out, here's a spoiler alert. We don't intend to solve racism today. <laughs> I know that will be a disappointment to some people. 
not here, not in the rest of the world. But we do believe that there's a lot of wisdom among us right here, and that we can learn a lot from pressing pause on our regularly scheduled programming to give our attention and our energy to the topic of racism and the hope for an anti-racist CCS. There will be multiple opportunities to share wisdom today in the context of lectures, course discussions, workshops, and group plenary discussions. There will be time for questions, answers, hopes, and visions. We'll close the day with multiple chances for reflection by hearing from others and by sharing our own learnings and insights. Those who can't join us in the building are here with us by way of streaming and WebEx. The links are accessible through Moodle if you're still looking for them. And Moodle includes space for uh, free form commentary and conversation between sessions as well. Our hope is that as we share time, conversation, and learning together today, we'll gain the insights, <coughs> wisdom, and renewed energy needed to make meaningful progress toward becoming an anti-racist community that sends anti-racist leaders into the world. Amen. There is a song, we won't leave here like we came, Amen. in Jesus' name. May it be so, in the name of Jesus, in the name of all that is holy and true, in the name of the divine that keeps us and leads us to greater glory. Amen. Amen. think about racism in ourselves, individually and corporately as an institution. In addition to being a brilliant scholar who has done foundational work in one of the most intriguing and promising areas of academia today, womanist methodology, uh, Dr. Towns is also uh, experienced with a deep understanding of institutions. Dr. Towns is the first Andrew Mellon Professor of African American Religion and Theology at Yale University Divinity School. In the fall of 2005, she was elected the first African American woman to serve in the presidential line of the American Academy of Religion. After that, she became the first African American and the first woman to serve as Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at Yale uh, Divinity School. She is the former Carolyn Williams Baird Professor of Christian Ethics at Union Theological Seminary. Uh, she's a prolific author, uh, lecturer, uh, and uh, just want to mention to you her, her groundbreaking book, Womanist Ethics and the Culture of Production of Evil, Cultural Production of Evil. If you haven't read it, I commend it to you. And she is just getting ready to uh, go to Nashville, Tennessee, where she will serve as the dean of Vanderbilt University Divinity School. This is such a promising move for theological education, has a real opportunity to make a difference in what happens in the development of religious leadership. Uh, and with all that, you can understand why we are so privileged to have her with us this year, but also here this morning to talk with us about uh, institutional racism. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you and learning with you, Dr. Towns. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, it's been it's a it's a little dour in here, and I know that we're talking about race and racism, but it does not have to be a death march. It actually can be a good thing, 
and I'm hoping that, um, I've never been called a promising move. Um, <laughs> but but it, it has a ring to it, I must say. Um, but I'm hoping that what I can do this morning is uh, begin the conversation anew, because I know it is something that CTS has already been talking about, struggling through, trying to live out, all these things. Um, and it actually is one of the reasons that um, attracted me here on a sabbatical year. Um, over and beyond um, the attractions of being with Laurel for a year. <laughs> but um, the CTS community is, for me, one of those lights of hope in theological education. You, know, you may not always get it right, but at least you're trying harder than a lot of places I can think of. And uh, that alone um, is energizing to be around every day as I uh, move through all the projects that I brought with me and hardly any of them got attended to. But that's the way it goes. So what I was asked to do was uh, sort of stir the pot for just a brief amount of time uh, and then switch to Q&A for us for the remainder of the time. I think we go till 10.30. 1030. Um, so um, what I've chosen to do is to, um, is to, is to do um, a few reflections entitled Willful Oblivion, Uninterrogated Coloredness as Moral Lacuna. Willful Oblivion, Uninterrogated Coloredness as moral lacuna. I begin with a quote. Invisible things are not necessarily not there. That a void may be empty, but it is not a vacuum. In addition, certain absences are so stressed, so ornate, so planned, they call attention to themselves, arrest us with intentionally and purpose, intentionality and purpose, like neighborhoods that are defined by the population held away from them. Looking at the scope of American literature, I can't help thinking that the question should have never been, why am I, an Afro-American, absent from it? It is not a particularly interesting query anyway. The spectacularly interesting question is, what intellectual feats had to be performed by the author or his critic to erase me from a society seething with my presence? And what effect has this performance had on the work? What are the strategies of escape from knowledge? or willful oblivion, not why, how. You may note that this is Toni Morrison. We are part of an academy that is well practiced at silences. This is ironic given how much talking goes on in our classrooms and at professional gatherings and in churches and in community meetings and in church meetings. Yet we have our silences that haunt us like so many methodological loose ends and or mangled analyses. This silence, these silences include more than race, ethnicity, sexuality, age, class. The list goes on and on. There are items on this list that many treat as a threadbare list of gripes, latter-day versions of what do they want? Or they get all the jobs, don't they? Abound in our academic musings in print, in professional so societies, at dinner parties, at social hours, in the offices of colleagues, in the halls of our institutions, in the sanctuaries of our churches. Somehow, and quite remarkably, a relatively few number of black women in the Theological Academy have become akin to Joel's horde of locusts, cutting, swarming, hopping, destroying. 
For others, we are Joel's relentless army, not swerving, not jostling, not halted, and entering theoethical religious discourses like thieves. In dazzling displays of intellectual hubris, orthodox moral discourses ignore the diversities within their and our midst in an ill-timed and increasingly irrelevant march toward an objective viewpoint that can lead us towards the capital T truth. Such inquiries have served and continue to preserve a moral and social universe that has mean-spirited at one end of its ontological pole and sycophancy at the other when pursued in a world of abstractions that mute the hard stuff of living. <clears throat> A large portion of noblesse oblige often acts as filler and buffer for those who seek to maintain or recapture an intellectual and material corpus that reeks of dumb and dumber status quo. In her ever-relevant 1989 essay, Unspeakable Things Unspoken, The Afro-American Presence in American Literature, Morrison notes that the notion of race is still virtually an unspeakable thing. She aptly points out a strong movement within the social sciences left largely unaddressed by the majority of scholars in theological disciplines to question the efficacy of race as a helpful category to explore our social order. She says, for 300 years, black Americans insisted that race was no usefully has, was no usefully distinguishing factor in human relationships. During those same 300 cent, three centuries, every academic discipline, including theology, history, and natural science, insisted race was the determining factor in human development. When blacks discovered they had been shaped or become a culturally formed race, and that it had specific and revered difference, Suddenly, they were told there was no such thing as race, biological or cultural. What matters and the genuinely intellectual exchange cannot accommodate it. It always seemed to me that the people who invented the hierarchy of race when it was convenient for them ought not be the ones to explain it away now that it does not suit their purpose for it to exist. I begin with these two extended quotations from Morrison to underscore the difficulty theoethical discourse has in addressing race and racism. We simply have not done it adequately or thoroughly as scholars, preachers, and teachers. Some see such analysis as veering into public policy. Others cannot find an adequate philosophical construct from which to peer into the mysteries of race. But peer and veer we must, and I propose a different tact in doing so. Morrison's question, not why, how, provides a methodological frame for willful oblivion, the way that coloredness remains inadequately interrogated within theological discourses. Many of our discussions on race divorce it from the profound impact that color consciousness and unconsciousness plays in our deliberations. Further, we focus on darker skinned peoples almost exclusively. This invites folks of European descent and others to ignore the social construction of whiteness. It allows darker skinned racial ethnic groups to ignore their internal color caste system. It often opens the door for weird bifurcations of class, race, gender, age, and so on. Race is a social construction as well as a cultural production where there are both implicit and explicit costs and benefits to collapsing race into uninterrogated coloredness. This is usually, if not always, wrapped around a spinning top of personal choices and communal power dynamics. Despite, it, despite inadequacies of how we have talked about and theorize race, I argue that although race is not natural, biological, or psychological, it does exist. 
It is Kabbalistic to argue that any with any level of sophistication or accuracy, accuracy that a category used to organize entire states, such as the Third Reich or South Africa, and is a part of our past and current US legal structures does not exist. As a fixed, immutable, or incapable of changing category, no. Race does not exist. As a relational process of shifting boundaries and social meanings, constantly engaged in political struggles, race does exist. Uninterrogated coloredness, also functioning in part as the myth of whiteness, views whiteness as an immutable condition that carries with it clear and distinct moral attributes, like being racist, not experiencing racism, being an oppressor, not experiencing oppression, silencing, not being silenced. Darker skinned peoples are defined in relation to this myth as non-whites who are acted upon by whites and have found their own identity through their resistance to white supremacy. Aside from it being problematic for any group to find its identity through non-ness, uninterrogated whiteness ignores the pluralities of whiteness itself. Acknowledging the ways in which we have treated whiteness as static, ahistorical, and objective helps to break open its uninterrogatedness. One thing we find when we do so is to recognize that racial terms have contested histories. However, whiteness tends to be excluded from the list of acceptable and debatable racial nouns. Gliding the slippery slope of white confession cannot solve this. Although the aim of white confession is to enable, if not provoke, white folks into realizing and admitting their own whiteness, it can quickly degenerate into a moralizing, altruistic endgame in which whites are characterized first by their moral failings and second by a fixed state from which to exercise the ultimate resistance to racism. White resistance to racism is bizarrely elevated to higher ethical and moral terrain. And yet another form of supremacy then emerges, one that does not recognize the arduous playing field of coloredness when engaging racism. Failing to recognize this tippy toes into paternalistic patterns that always belie hair-footed bouts of confession. Likewise, Avoiding the messiness and complexity of race in the quest for colored blindness serves to make palatable a bootlicking selective engagement with our genuine differences. Differences that are assumed to be divisive rather than enriching. Much of the discourse on color blindness actually brackets and ignores our coloredness. When taken to extreme, it assumes a non-colored self who, when disrobed, is actually, and not very surprisingly, actually whiteness redux. To ring ourselves around a deadly maypole of uninterrogated, uninterrogated coloredness is to dance literally with the devil. Whiteness has been and continues to be strategically maintained through trumpeting its colorlessness. The values, belief systems, privileges, histories, experiences of white folk are marked as normal or natural or worse, natural and neutral. All else is the exception to it. This gigantic superego is absolutely lethal. In an eerily warped way, uninterrogated whiteness uses its own comfort as the measuring stick for how other people should exist. If we are dealing with perfection or divinity, this would not be problematic, but we are not. We continue to view each other through veils of stereotypes and innuendos. However, maintaining whiteness as an abstraction is misshapen hierophany. Whiteness is the invisible thing that is there. 
Perhaps Bell Hooks is on to something when she notes that since most white folks do not have, do not see blacks, therefore making them invisible, that they can imagine that they are invisible to blacks as well. Those of us who are darker skinned in the room know this is not true. But this does help explain in part why whiteness functions as an abstraction on a conscious and unconscious level. It also is and can be a strategy of subterfuge and suppression that continues feasting on a diet of domination, diminishment, and disavowal. And quite frankly, this sucks. To return to Morrison, not why, how. I have only skimmed the surface of this iceberg this morning to get the conversa conversation rolling. As thorny as it can be to shift our attention to coloredness as we gather all colors around the table of analysis and discernment methodologically and concretely to understand the social construction and cultural production of race, it is necessary to engage the challenge. This means not only in the classroom, but also in our research and writing as we put into place more just patterns of hermeneutics and analyses. Collapsing race into uninterrogated coloredness begets an essentialist swamp that oozes flawed and inadequate critiques and strategies. The destruction of willful obli oblivion takes all the sharp tools we can muster, all of us. No one has the corner on righteousness here, and certainly no one has a pristine moral life such that he or she can stand outside of this epistemological challenge. So given all the locust activity women, womanists are often charged with committing, it is hard work doing the actual toil we in fact do. Nevertheless, even in the face of gross intractability of willful obli oblivion, in uninterrogated coloredness, high camp drag, I still hold on to the great hope that I will be old when I die. For dying of old age for a black woman in my generation who spends a good deal of her time awash in not only uninterrogated coloredness, but gender, sexuality, aging, class, and more, for someone like me, and not a few of you who may my, be my age, older or younger, living a long and good life is the ultimate act of defiance and resistance. It is, in fact, living womanist large with Sapphire's Bite, Aunt Jemima's Good Food, Topsy's Rope-A-Dope, Jezebel's Passion, Miss Nora's Wisdom, and my Mama Mary's Intellect. Amen. Let the conversation begin. It is now Q&A time. Ideas, thoughts, formed and unformed, questions, erudite and a little confused. All is on the table as we begin this important conversation. Because Amen, corner folk. What was, what was happening? What was resonating? It was over in here. Um,
a little lighter than my father. Why in my family Christmas, on the rare occasions when we could get my parents to go out to dinner, because they didn't like to do it. They were raised in a generation where that was dangerous. Mm -hmm. Why was it that I was the one the waiters and waitresses talked to? Even though you got two older folks, sit, clearly older folks, sitting at the table, presumably paying the bill. Mm -hmm. But I was the one, never my father, never my mother, never my sister, me. Mm -hmm. Something is going on there about acceptability mm -hmm. and safety mm -hmm. and why color is not as problematic. And certainly when I talk to colleagues in the academy across the, dark, the, the darkness spectrum, those of us who are lighter skinned have had an easier time in academia than those of us who are darker skinned oftentimes. And a lot of that has to do with the fact of not how bright we are, but how light we are. Mm -hmm. So there's something in race in this country that has to do with coloredness and that's why I wanted to pull us back, because too many of the conversations about race in the US, talk, we talk about black folk and Latinas and Latinas and maybe Native Americans and sometimes Asian and Asian Americans, but we never seem to get in the white folks as being a problem. So I began to re recognize that maybe I need to talk about this differently and ask us to think about it differently. So that's why I came up with the notion of uninterrogated coloredness. We just don't pay attention, consciously. Unconsciously, we are working it all the time, all the time. So that's some of the background. If you want to read the fuller description, it's in um, Womanist Ethics and the Cultural Production of Evil, I forget which chapter, but it's the chapter that features sapphire. Um, hi, my name is Heather, um, and as a feminist, I know that there's a very broken history in the relationship of feminism and womanism, mm -hmm. and that's something I've really been trying to delve into this semester is kind of the pain and acknowledging intersectionality, but it's interesting when I'm in feminist consciousness uh, awareness groups trying to open it up and say, let's talk about all these intersectionalities. And there's somewhat of a sense of like, you talked about a spinning top of some of the factors, but it's almost like we spiral out and it's almost impossible to effectively acknowledge issues except one at a time. So mm -hmm. I guess my question is like, how to address the, the linearity of some of the issues without neglecting the complexity? Yeah, I, I think that's true. I, um, I, I sometimes teach a class called, um, the political economy of misery. Mm. And I taught it last, last spring. And I always leave race to the last. Mm -hmm. Because I've learned over the years, the class has to build a sense of its, uh, itself as a class and its own identity mm -hmm. and some level of trust. Because to start with race means it'll never happen in the class and we won't get to anything else we're doing. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, this class that had been engaged and lively around sex and sexual orientation and sexuality and class and class consciousness, went through some painful stories of what was going on um, for them uh, as in family histories and whatnot. Everybody went mute when we got to race, everybody. And I kept pushing and prodding and encouraging and cajoling. And finally, my, my teaching fellow said, well, you know, what worked in the beginning was you telling stories. Mm. And I thought about it. I said, yeah, we have gotten more discursive as we've gone around it this semester. And you know, maybe it is time. So the next class, and I would name it in class. I said, you know, we've gotten quiet. What's going on? <laughs> People who were chatty. You know, sinking down into, I've never seen people disappear right in front of my face like that. <laughs> um, so I started, I, I started, I told them the story of my family going out to, to dinner one night with my, my mother who liked to be uh, difficult because she'd rather be home and my father who was just uncomfortable 
uh, when he was at um, predominantly white eateries. He'd, he'd, had, he'd had too many experiences mm -hmm. growing up. Um, and my sister, who loved to explore culinary delights, so she was all excited. And I was thinking, oh man, this is a train wreck coming in. <laughs> and it was. But talking about what that was like and how we had to negotiate and how I had to deal with the servers and, and all that. And then that started to open things up. Sometimes telling stories out of your particularity mm -hmm. is a way to integrate more than one thing at the same time. Because I guarantee you there's almost no story that's only about one thing. Mm -hmm. um, and folks, if you do, if you tell a story about an incident in your life or in the lives of others with as much precision as possible, people begin to hear the connections in their own lives and may bring in a whole nother idea so that you can talk about it together. But often, it's almost like we have to um, sneak up on racism in order to talk about it because we're so afraid for reasons I, I, I think I know, but I also don't always understand, because I think it's just as um, explosive to talk about sex and sexuality and class and age and all those things. Um, we are scared to death of doing it. I think, and I think some of that has to do with the fact that we're such bad historians. We know just enough history badly to make us dangerous to each other. And we assume, I think, more often than not, that to delve into the history, the racial history of who we have been as a nation means that somebody's always going to get blamed and damned to hell. And somebody's always going to be victorious. And it's never going to be us. Rather than realizing the history of the US around race is a mini complex thing. And sometimes we go in and find that there have been some valiant moves taken in our family systems around race. And sometimes we find, you know, they were pretty bad. But there's always the sense that the only thing we're going to find is badness and wretchedness. And I want to encourage us, you know, if, if in fact, we say we trust in the Lord, then we need to act like it yes. around issues of race. Yes. Um, and, 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 and dare to be wrong. My question is, do we know what to do when we've been right? Amen. Mm. I don't know. I think we're afraid of that one as much as the other. So start storytelling is one idea I would, I would toss out for you. Um, because these things are not linear. I am more than just a black blob before you. There's a whole lot going on in my isness, all at once at the same time. And that's true for all of us. So we're not, the, we, we, we wanna, sometimes we wanna tackle things in a linear way to control them. Maybe it's okay to be out of control and just sort of walk around in the mess for a while and then start to make sense out of it. Um, hi, uh, my name is Charles May. I'm a student here. Um, as a white male who was born and raised in the post de jure um, segregation era, in the era of Sesame Street and Mr. Rogers and the United Colors of Benetton, I, I find myself <laughs> ill at ease confronting my own racism. Mm. Um, because we have been taught and ingrained into us um, by a lot of people, by many sources in the media, and rightfully so, that racism is an inherent evil. But we, I myself, because we've been taught that, this, that it is this inherent evil, resist claiming my own racist attitudes, mm -hmm. much to my detriment, I think, mm -hmm. because I don't want to be labeled as 
I'm a racist or I'm a sexist or I'm mm -hmm. um, you know, a, an element or a, a tool of the oppressor, oppressors, the, the patriarchy, the, the, the white privilege, even though I have benefited from that. So what, I guess what my question is, um, how can we overcome the fear of being labeled racist? Mm -hmm. Because as long as we're afraid to be labeled as racist, I don't think that we can overcome mm -hmm. the racism, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense mm -hmm. whatsoever. Yeah, it does, it does. I think it's a natural human reaction. We don't like labels that make signal we're a little less than. But the one thing I do know is you can't hide from evil. You can't hide from sin. And the only way I know to address either of those two things is to stare right back at it and walk into it and confront yourself. You're not, you, may not, you may be surprised what you find there. No, it, again, there's a, there's, I hear within your question the assumption that what you might find will be bad. You might actually find some good stuff there. You want to discount that? So you don't know. So I think two things are at stake here. Um, a sort of innate, for some of us, urge to control our change which means we probably never get to transformation because we're always managing how much we change. That's not faithful. There's, there's, a, there's a ceiling drip. Uh, and I, I'm just glad it was water. Um, and the second thing I, 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 I hear as a possible thing here is the fear of fear. Both of those things are normal and natural. But I would encourage anyone who, like you, is, has enough awareness. You know, I, I watched Sesame Street with the little kids in daycare, where I was in the older part of the kids' set. So I grew up on Wanda the Witch, who washed her wiry wig on a windy, wintry Wednesday. <laughs> my Sesame Street moment, but um, is don't do it by yourself. Um, this kind of change around race and racism and learning to be anti-racist for the rest of your life, because it won't be an event. It's a process that will carry you through to the other side of the Jordan. I'm not sure how much further beyond, because I haven't been there, so I don't know. But I do know this is something that takes to get better at better and better at being anti-racist, um, is that we can find some folk who are committed in a similar fashion as we are, so that we have a community of accountability. Because there's a, there's a way in which, in US society, we really still have the Lone Ranger mentality ranging around a lot of the times. And that is so deadly for social change. So you, we need to have folks around us who are as committed as us, but differently, to changing ourselves and the world around us, to hold us all accountable to the change that, changes that we're going through all the time. So don't do it by yourself. Step into the fear. It won't kill you. I tr trust me, it won't kill you. Just don't be foolish and do dumb things. Now, that might kill you. <laughs> but, um, and, and realize that maybe it's okay to let God be in control. Amen. Mm -hmm. And it might work. Mm -hmm. You might see some changes. Um, because I think that one of the things that all of us face and it is, well, all of us have a hard time facing is who we look at when we look in the mirror. All of us. And, and that was a lightning flash. I'm not sure I should keep talking. Um, <laughs> but but it's, um, it's, it's important. See, I told you. <laughs> so, um, 
I hope so. I have a thing about lightning and thunder, which is another story that I won't tell today because it's too revelatory. Um, <laughs> but, but I think that, that, that we, we just, I think we live in the fear of being known. All of us, really known. Um, and sometimes that's healthy because there's some people you really don't want to know you. But that, that, you know, for the one, people whom we have intimate connections, for the people we're in ministry with, for the people who, um, particularly the young folks are coming, they have to see evidence of what perf non-perfection is in someone who's trying. Mm -hmm. So don't give up on yourself. It's too soon. You're too young. I'd say that by whatever old age you were in here, but too soon, too young. Yes. I'm Marion McKinney. Where are you, Marion? Right. Oh, okay. <laughs> I hear the voice. Um, your statement, um, I believe you said, and maybe you can say it again, living a good life is the ultimate form of resistance. A long life. A good long life, yes. I left out the long. Um, that resonated with me as, as truth with a capital T. Mm -hmm. um, I was glad to hear you say something about isness because I think there's a lot of isness in that, but um, I was asking myself, well, what, what's in there in the living the long good life? Is it being, doing, loving? Is it just isness? Can you say more about that? Yeah, I'm actually being much more... Um, Plebeian. Black women's survival rates are lower than everybody else's. And if you put it on a, actually, except for Native Americans in this country. So just living a long life is an act of resistance for black women. Um, and I think, it, I'll, I'll, I'll tell a story about my friend Dodie. Um, Dodie, uh, who's in her late 70s now, a white woman, Lutheran, lay, lay person who's Lutheran, uh, worked for the denomination for a long time, and then when they moved to uh, Chicago, she said, I don't want to go, but she was in Philadelphia. So she and her husband, Bob, who was ordained Lutheran pastor, took a church in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, inner city church, where everybody drove in big downtown, still rich Lutheran church with everybody driving in. Dodie being Dodie and Bob being Bob said, mm, no, we're not getting a manse out where everybody else is living. We're going to live in the community. So they bought a row house for themselves, a row house for Dodie's ministry, which was uh, called Hooperati. The Hooperati were the rowers in the longboats that did, kept the fast beat going because she was, had an anti-racism uh, ministry and a row house for her parents, all in the inner city. And so Dodie set out on her anti-racism work and was going great duns, working in Lutheran colleges and other places that would invite her in. And she would put together a team to come in and do the work for that specific location. So it was hard work because she was constantly remaking the people she worked with. Uh, she wasn't feeling well and went, decided she needed to go check out what was going on with a doctor. Dodie being Dodie, closed her eyes, opened up the yellow pages, pointed, <laughs> so, looked under the name, called the doctor, went. Turned out to be a black male physician in the neighborhood. He ran tests. Tests came back. He was puzzled by the results. So he ran some more tests. Tests came back. He was still puzzled, even more so. And he said to her, let me ask you what you do. So Dodie being Dodie started talking about Hooperati and all the stuff she was doing, asked him if he wanted to be one of the team members. Yeah, you know, <laughs> that's what she did. She was a networker. Amen, amen. He burst out laughing. She got an attitude <laughs> because she wasn't feeling well and she didn't appreciate him laughing. So after he got himself back together, she said, what is so funny about me being sick? 
He said, Dodie, you have the medical profile of a black woman your age, mm. not a white woman. You've got all the stress markers and all the physical maladies of a black woman. Mm. You are not taking this work lightly. Mm. You're living it. Mm. Now, Dodie told me this story, and I was like, oh, damn. <laughs> Because what it says is, if you commit fully, there are physical costs to anti-racism work. So if someone who, lit, she, she living a privileged life, she still had a pretty comfortable life, but the work she was doing was affecting her physically. Imagine what that's like for somebody who lives that every day of their life from the time they're born and what that does to life expectancy. So for me, I was signaling living a long life is an act of resistance because so many black women don't get to be even be my age at 57. We're gone. We're gone. I mean, think of the number of people we know we've lost in their 40s and early 50s through heart attack, diabetes, stress-related illnesses violence. So I wasn't, I'm glad you went to the more noble and wonderful things with it, but I was being much more, here's the, here's the hard edges of living. I, uh, I regard the thunder as a good thing, Emily. <laughs> I think she's pleased. <laughs> um, well, it is my it's sign of my Orisha in Candomblé, so. And I'm not saying, am I, am I not on? Talking to this part? This part. Okay. Yeah, that this, part. Um, I'm not saying this is either or. I'm just saying this is more. Mm -hmm. Down in Grant Park, the first uh, election of President Obama, I'm looking around, and all the white people were crying. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, why are all these white people crying? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I was just happy. McCain, Palin, you know, hadn't been elected. And so I talked to folk, and the emotional outpouring seemed to be, this proves we're not racist. Mm -hmm. Truth. Mm -hmm. As like in an earlier generation, I marched with King. Or I thought about marching with King. I didn't get to it, but I thought about it. But that people, white people, wanted to be okay. free of mm -hmm. a diffuse sort of guilt, and they wanted to get over it. Mm -hmm. And this has caused me, in my own work, to try to spell race J-O-B-S. Mm -hmm. It's jobs. The economic production of racism, the prison industrial complex, the war on drugs, mm -hmm. the jobless recovery, that all the rest of this has produced, amplified, and pitted people against one another mm -hmm. in a shrinking economy that is evil, as you write. And so I think as an ad, I wanted to put the jobs in there mm -hmm. because at the end of the day something this evil doesn't just happen mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. with the best will in the world um, you ain't gonna solve it unless you look up and you look out and you say who benefits mm -hmm. who benefits mm -hmm. and then not to say the other work is unimportant it's all part of the same toxic stew, mm -hmm. but without the acceleration, it's accelerating in my perspective, mm -hmm. of the economic production of a slave class, again, still, you're not going to get it, and you're going to be ineffective in struggling against it, mm -hmm. in my view. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good addition. We have a question over here. I have a question. Uh, thank you so much.
so much for all that you said today. Uh, I'd like to go back to your process of doing anti-racism work. Mm -hmm. I was fascinated um, about some of the themes that, that came about that you said, community, doing this work in community, uh, sitting in the mess and in the pain, confrontation. Those were some of the things that resonated with me. One of the things that I found very hard and that people resist, again, is that, that sitting in the pain and in the mess. And so my question mm -hmm. is, how long do you sit there? Mm. How do you know when to move? Uh, what are we looking for in mm -hmm. the mess? Mm -hmm. Because that's, that's the hard part no one wants to go to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. And then I think about just America in general and how we just like to stuff things down and, not, and don't talk about it. And from what I know as a counselor, as we, as we continue to do that generation after generation, it becomes larger and larger and deeper and mm -hmm. deeper and more bitter. Mm -hmm. and, and so... I guess I just, I have two questions. The one is, what do we do in the mess? Mm -hmm. And then looking at America now, and it just seems so big, what would be the strategy? And, and I like what you said, but just nationwide, what would be the strategy for America mm -hmm. in regards to anti-racism? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, if I forget one of them, uh, remind me when I stop talking. <laughs> the point of confronting yourself is to not fall in love with yourself. Mm -hmm. And so um, the one thing that um, I always use when I'm confronted with a real cesspool of stuff, I start, where do, where do I want to get to? Where do I want this mess to move to? And I keep my eye on that so that I don't fall in love with being in, you, know, you, can, you can fall in love with being in a mess. It becomes very comfortable. You know the mess, you know the smell, you know the textures, you know the people, and everybody's learned how to get along. So that's not always helpful. So you have to keep your eye on where you want to go. And you have to be looking for the strategies that will get you there so that you don't stay in that mess. A vision, I mean, it's, it, we sometimes go, oh, Lord, here we go again. Without a vision, the people perish. But it's true. It's true. So you have to have that goal, that future. And, and hopefully that future is more just, more fair, more loving, more humane more filled with possibilities. Um, and the second one was? Just in regards to America. It just oh. so Yeah. Big. Never start big, start small. <laughs> um, the whole point, the, one of the ways that tough situations remain that way and become systemic is because we try to st attack the whole thing all at once, when in fact, we start where we are. We build local and move global. And I think that's so important because if, you could, if we can figure out how to work with the people around us who are going to be just as difficult when we go larger and larger, then we get strategies for change that will be effective on a larger and larger scale. Um, looking at Obama's Campaign strategy should teach us a lot of things. They went very, very, very local and built from there. Um, at a time when I wasn't sure he was going to get reelected, frankly. I wasn't nearly as surprised the first time as I was the second time. Um, so we have to figure out these local strategies and not make them. Um, so parochial, but realize that what we're building for is the next thing, is the next stage, is the next arena. And then that keeps us from being these little insular people. We got it here. Well, maybe, but we have to keep moving. So those would be my responses. 
Good morning. My name is Teresa Smallwood. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm really interested in the institutional racism component. You know, we, we can, these conversations are always great and it always seems to, you know, kind of focus on the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. But um, just looking at CTS, and I appreciate so much all of the comments you made about how we're getting it right and we have a lot of things going for us, and I do agree. Um, I'm happy here, mm -hmm. but there are a lot of things that concern me mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. um, and the uninterrogated coloredness is one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just concerned about being able to walk down the hallway and have people speak. And I'm also concerned about what I have encountered myself with comments from papers that want to sort of put me in a box like I'm not quite as intelligent mm. as other folk. Mm -hmm. Or even just, you know, if we want to talk about jobs, just look at the, you know, the breakdown of where black folks are and white folks are. Mm -hmm. And, and talk to me about, you know, what can we do in this little microcosm of the world to really speak to the uninterrogated coloredness? I'm pausing because it's such a big question you just asked in such a short amount of time um, mm -hmm. that you asked it in because I don't know all of CTS's history, and uh, that's a dangerous thing. Yeah. So that's the first place to go to. Mm -hmm. Let's get all of the history. Not just the glory days, but we had Shelby Rooks and we had Ken uh, Smith, and we had whomever we had. Um, but the, the, the total history of what the institution has been over its lifetime. Uh, in other words, you, you got to do a, 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 a grade sheet. What's happened? But um, once that's in place, the question then comes for me when I'm looking at an institution. What's the will of the faculty? Mm. What's the will of the student body? What's the will of the staff? Mm. All three of those entities because all three of those entities make up the institution. Mm -hmm. Recognizing that students are a changing thing. You know, places that want to hold something in place, mm -hmm. like my soon-to-be former institution, Yale, yeah, it's been around 300 years. It knows if it waits long enough, these students will be out of here. Mm. And maybe the next generation we get in here won't be asking all these, dangerous questions. They just be happy to be here. Um, so institutions know that when you've got a population that's constantly changing, that they have a limited shelf life and what kind of change they can actually bring into an institution. The group that stays longest often are staff and faculty. In those two places, what's the will? to be more of who the institution says it wants to be. And how would one get there? What's the game plan? What does it look like? What does it mean? What kinds of resources are, and I will just talk about faculty, because I know that group best. In a faculty, what are the, what are the resources used in classes? particularly the classes that are foundational classes. Um, is it a sea of whiteness? <laughs> is it a little sprinkle? Is it a mix? How well do the professors know the material for the things they weren't trained in? In other words, how well do we as teachers continue to train ourselves? in new ways of thought, new methodologies, even if we disagree with them. I mean, I had to learn Tillich. <laughs> I like what he does with signs and symbols, and that's about all I use a Tillich these days. But 
it's important to know some of that stuff so that I can communicate it to my students. Even though what I really want to, might want to talk about is a Toni Morrison riff mm -hmm. on how, I mean, that, how many of you have read Paradise, her book Paradise, and that incredible sermon she does on the cross mm -hmm. in that book? There is more theological thought in that sermon than I can see sometimes in some of the people I read all the time. Mm whose names I won't call, like Howard Wass, <laughs> folks like that. So it, it, it's, um, it's important to continue as a faculty to broaden the resources we use, to know them well, even if we disagree with them. Because you, my mantra has always been, even when I'm teaching someone I heartily disagree with, my job in that class session is to convince the students they are right. So then I can then go back and say, and here's why they're wrong. But, but that's teaching, that's pedagogy. Um, how do we form our curricula? What, does, what, what kinds of things um, invite people in from across different places in humanity? Those are the sorts of questions, I think, that a faculty that cares about it will ask itself. And it, it may be, well be that the CTS faculty is. I've stayed out of faculty politics on purpose mm -hmm. while I've been here, so I don't know. So I'm just telling you what, if I were still at Yale, going to be at Yale, I would be asking these questions. Now that I'm going to Vanderbilt, I am going to be asking these questions. And I already warned them, so they, they won't be surprised. They may not like it. But it's, it's important to know that we can never as teachers and scholars rest on what we know. And please, let's not continue to use the same lecture Amen. we used 10 years ago, five years ago. Because there's more going on in our disciplines than that. This will be our last question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, first, I, I amen your, I, I amen a lot. But um, I really, <laughs> I amen the, the living a long, good life as an act of defiance and resistance. Uh, as someone whose mother died at 56, whose grandmother died in her early 50s, I'm, I refuse to die that young, and I'm not going to. Um, OK. <laughs> but my question is, um, how do we keep uh, Latinos as part of this conversation, mm -hmm. um, especially those of us who, who understand that we come from African descent, um, many of us, and have this not just be a black and white issue? Mm -hmm. The, um, well, first you just brought it in, so that's helpful. Um, I also wasn't thinking when I was thinking about coloredness, talking about black, white. I, I'm trying to talk about the color spectrum because um, I was having a conversation with Miguel de la Torre years and years ago, and Miguel was uh, in a fierce, there's no other way to call it, but battle with Ada Maria Sassi Diaz over the issue of race and racism in Cuba. Mm -hmm. And I won't tell you who was arguing what, but <laughs> one of them was saying, we can't deal with racism in the US. We need to not deal with racism in Cuba because it's too much of a distraction. And the other was saying, we have to deal with it because we practice it here mm -hmm. when we get here. Um, and so I was asking Miguel, you know, what's at stake in this conversation for you? Because he was getting beat up pretty badly for his position. And um, he said, you know, Latinos often hide mm -hmm. behind the black-white battle so that we can sort of get our work done, live our lives, be who we are, keep our culture, and succeed in the US. Not all of us, but a lot of us do this. He said, and we become as bad a part of the problem because we don't see the sources of possible solidarity so that everybody can get ahead and move on and learn and whatnot. And I took that conversation seriously over the years. It's like, who is hiding behind a black-white dialogue or war or whatever is going on? 
um, and what benefits are being gained or lost. And I think that's one of the things any group that's not in that thicket of things has to ask itself. And where are the points of solidarity and difference in the midst of that? And then, what can that dynamic learn from yet another culture coming, or set of cultures, because Latino and Latinas is a mini splendor thing, and not all y'all get along. That's right. Um, so so what, what can we learn around ethnicity by adding ethnicity into the mix? and culture about how hard it is for us to embrace our diversities in the US. Mm -hmm. Somehow we think, you know, diversity is a D word. Mm -hmm. It's somehow, it's, it's a bad thing. And I, I actually kind of like the fact that we kind of are a motley crew because I think uh, that's probably more representative of the realm of God, mm -hmm. that diversity. Thank you all for this morning, and uh, and I trust the rest of the day will leave you engaged, thinking, feeling, and then doing. Amen. Thanks again to all of you for your participation in this session, this plenary session. Your workshops are next. You'll, be, you'll have the choice of going to one of the courses or um, to an independent workshop that will be done by Solomon Sudakar right back here in this room. Um, but in between time, you have a 15-minute break. So I'll see you then. <laughs>